And tonight we'll be joined by three librarians uh, who will attempt to reconstruct life and lifestyle in Singapore based on print advertisements from 1830s to 60s. Uh, they will also be sharing on their discoveries about Singapore's fashion trends across different cultures and eras, as well as the early days of our local hospitality, uh, F&B and entertainment industries through those ads. And our speakers for tonight are Ms. Fiona Lim, an Associate Librarian with the National Library's uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia team. She's interested in the interrogation of places and their histories as a means of engaging with the city. She contributed a chapter on hospitality advertisement for the book Between the Lines, which is here in the front. Between the Lines, Print Advertising in Singapore, 1830s, 1960s, which she also edited and produced. Our second speaker will be Akshita Paktar, Assistant Manager in Research of uh, Content and Services Team. She conducts research into public policy and uh, current affairs and has a very keen interest in uh, cultural studies. And the last but not the least, of course, we have Liberian Go Yu Mei. She works with the Chinese Arts and Literary Collection and has recently updated the bibliography of Singapore Chinese literature. And her research interest lies in the interaction between society and Chinese literature. So without further ado, uh, we're going to have Fiona Lim to start the session. Fiona, please. Thanks. Today, I'm going to focus on only the colonial hotels, the European-run hotels, because for other types of accommodations and lodgings, as well as F&B ads, you can refer to the chapter that I wrote for the book, as well as the exhibition upstairs on level 10. Okay, so I'm going to touch on three major points, first of which is the... Um, the discrepancy between the lived realities and expectations created by ads. The second would be the narratives promoted by advertisements. And the third, marketing strategies to attract the wealthy Western traveller. So I'll be using a lot, not a lot, a few um, travellers' accounts. And we have to keep in mind that people of that um, time, particularly, they have... Uh, colonial worldviews and they also have their own biases so we have to read it a bit critically as well. Okay, so the London Hotel. So this was um, the first major hotel in Singapore and it was established in 1839 by Gaston Dutronqui. So as you can read from the ad, it was located on the Esplanade, which is the Padang. And the word Esplanade will be repeated quite often in several of the ads you will see later. And um, it appears that he had a contract with the Peninsula and Oriental Company, which is the P&O shipping line. So passengers from the P&O shipping line would likely go to the London Hotel. And the amenities highlighted are hot and cold baths at all hours, four excellent billet tables and a good skittle ground. Um, skittle is a game of bowling played by the British. So here I would just highlight the fact that apparently patrons would find every comfort when they stay there. However, this is one of the reviews of the London Hotel. So this was written in 1853 by a traveller. He wrote under a pseudonym, but it was later discovered that his this um, yeah, European men. There are several hotels in Singapore, the best of which is the London Hotel. But even in this establishment, there is great room for improvement. The hotel consists of two up to... Okay, so anyway, basically he's saying that it was extremely noisy and he gave it like a one-star review. Yeah, the bowling alley was a huge nuisance to the inmates of the hotel. Another review. So, um... <laughs> This is an American businessman, George Francis Train. He wrote this in 1857, a few years after the previous review. The hotel was kept in a manner that would disgrace a landlord in the backwood of Kansas, where your food looks uninviting and is brought to you by Asiatics and Islanders who always seem to me to have their hands upon their half clad body when you want a piece of bread, some Malay curry, or a pineapple. Yeah, so I think um, the racist overtones are pretty obvious. Clearly, I don't think either of them met with every comfort during their stay at the London Hotel. So here we have the Hotel de l'Europe. And um, again, it overlooks Singapore's beautiful esplanade. 
the Padang and before the reclamation, the Padang faced the harbour directly. So they probably had a very fantastic view of um, the harbour. So it states here several things. Um, the oldest then, yeah, and the only establishment facing the Esplanade and um, foreign languages spoken. Here you see an illustrated panorama of um, the hotel, but actually um, at this point the hotel was under renovation and they were, it, was, it was going through a major overhaul. So this is the artist's impression of the hotel after its renovation. It's highlighted that it's only a two minutes walk from Johnston's Pier, which was um, a place of disembarkment for many visitors to Singapore in the 19th century and early 20th century. But um, I was looking at this map, and um, it appears that Johnston's Pier was actually near where the Fullerton Hotel currently is, and Hotel de l'Europe was like just on the edge of Coleman Street and um, facing the Padang where actually the National Gallery now is, the former Supreme Court. So I think it would probably take more than two minutes of walking or even running to get from Johnston's Pier to the Hotel de l'Europe. So another advertisement by the Hotel de l'Europe. Here you see the same panorama at the bottom. It, is, it was still a forthcoming building um, the following year in 1906 and it was still the only hotel facing the Esplanade. However, what's interesting about this advertisement is that at the top there is um, a photograph that apparently shows the old premises of the hotel. However, you could hardly see the hotel. So it's heavily obscured by trees. So it's like a bit curious why you would choose to show this image. Anyway, when you put both together, it actually shows um, progress made over its relatively long history of 50 years. Another thing I wanted to say is that um, we usually, for, for these um, colonial hotels, they feature the architecture very prominently and um, we don't see what's around the building. However, I found um, an excerpt that could perhaps shed some light on what would be happening around the building itself. So here is um, a piece of writing in published in the Straits Times in 1905. Um, I highlighted the part that's relevant for you. Then there is the corner at the Hotel de l'Europe, which is a regular grandstand for beggars of all sorts. The sick policemen stationed in the roadway, they're absolutely ignoring them. So it paints um, a picture for us beyond just the hotel and its facade and also the life surrounding the hotels themselves. So the Adelphi was also a very big name in the 19th century along with Raffles Hotel and the Europe Hotel. So here we see the architecture of the buildings very prominently featured right in the center quite imposing. So basically, the colonial architecture for these European hotels were often heavily featured in their advertisements and um, it helps to project a kind of power as well as of luxury and the kinds of European comforts that would attract a wealthy traveler from the West. The Raffles Hotel. Of course, it was going to come. So we have the Raffles Hotel. It was open in 1887. Here, uh, I'm sorry, the text is quite small, but the box at the bottom is actually like a very detailed list of dignitaries and um, officials, important people, aristocrats, basically, who have ever stayed at the Raffles Hotel up until the 1906. Yep. The interiors are featured on the right side. Um, at advertisement, especially mentions the fact that there is uh, there are two European chefs immediately supervising the restaurant. So the implication is that it can be guaranteed of great European standards. On the right hand side, you see them, you see the ad promoting modern sanitation and comforts, which was yes a big deal because um, flush toilets were introduced mainly in the 1920s. 
and not many places had them. And in fact, Raffles was one of the first to introduce electric lighting and fans in Singapore. Um, the next ad shows also a Raffles Hotel ad. What I would like to point attention to is this quote by English writer Somerset Morgan. Um, the hotel stands for all the fable, fables of the exotic East. So this quote was heavily used by um, Raffles Hotel and its marketing team from the 1950s onwards. So in a way, they were inviting customers, patrons, visitors to partake in this very orientalist fantasy that they are creating. And I believe um, with the legend of Raffles Hotel, people are very familiar with it because it still exists today, unlike um, the other hotels that I showed earlier. But even then, it had its bad days. So this is uh, like another one-star review of Raffles Hotel. So it was not carpeted and people were dancing. It was known for its um, ballroom dances. And when people were returning to their rooms after a whole night of dancing, this man, Harbin, I believe he's an English traveler, it really irritated him. So it also the staff were moving about as they're apt to do nearly all night. By six in the morning, sleep is impossible and it's out of the question after lunch. So five days of this hotel reduced us to a pulp. Oh dear. Yeah, and furthermore, the hotel is extremely expensive and full of a rather bourgeois crowd of English who evidently think themselves the best people and whose women dress as if they came from the north of England or Birmingham or the Regent Palace Hotel. So it really conjures up like quite a hilarious image of um, yeah, women in really inappropriate dresses dancing in the ballroom. This is one of my favorites. Seaview Hotel, giving away free ozone. So ozone, um, it is an informal British term referring to fresh air, particularly sea breeze. So um, seaside hotels were really popular in the 1920s and 30s, although the first one started in the 1880s. And um, a huge marketing strategy for these seaside outfits was to promote the health benefits that could be had when you are located close to the sea because of the ozone. So here, ozone is a better tonic than any medicine made by men. Nature gives us more than enough here, no extremes of temperature, but a restful, healthful atmosphere full of bracing, energizing elements from the sea, a natural growth of the finest, wonderful, curative baths. So basically, it will make, like, you will renew you if you were to stay at Seaview Hotel in 1907. It was really common for ads like this to appear for um, seaside outfits. Another strategy that um, the hotels took was to, for seaside hotels at least, was to juxtapose against the city hotel. So you can see Adelphi and Seaview on the same ad because they were actually run by the same people at this point in the 1950s, the Saki's brothers, who also ran Raffles Hotel. So it's quite cute, the illustration of the city and instead of buildings, you have like palm trees, and in the ad on the right, it tells us that it's an ideal seaside resort. Every room had bath and there's modern sanitation and it's delightful throughout the year. It's also only a short distance from town. And this short distance was actually five miles, eight kilometers. However, the journey is not mentioned in the advertisements for obvious reasons. This is a rather graphic account of one man's tortuous journey, five mile, eight kilometer journey to the Seaview Hotel from the town center. It's, yeah, it's really descriptive. I love it. If you could escape the pestiferous evil of that drive to and fro, then Tanjung Katong might be written down as a delightful asset to Singapore. As it is, the approach entirely kills its many charms. <laughs> Starting from the center of the city by way of Beach Road, it is well to adjust your gas mask or handkerchief to the nose. The first order to overpower you is a strong fishy smell from the Clyde Terrace Market, which is um, on Beach Road. 
this, however, is you decolon compared to what will follow in rapid succession. Take heart if you can, for it is only a five mile drive to Sea View. However, he gave it like a five star review. But once you actually emerge alive from this really dreadful journey, the sea bathing is really first class, the air refreshingly cool, you can dine under the stars. So Sea View always struck me as an ideal place. Once there, by the back of my mind, always looked the terror of that drive back to Singapore. Yep, that's all I have for you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming for this talk. My name is Akshita, and today I'll be sharing some insights on the early printed fashion ad advertisements. So Singapore in the 19th century was a thriving cosmopolitan free port. People of di diverse ethnicities came to Singapore and they all followed the dress codes from back home. So visitors and travelers who passed by Singapore always wrote about this diverse um, population that you could see, a mix of population that you could see on the streets. One of the travel writers, Isabella Bird, uh, commented on uh, the costumes and she said that every kind of costumes could be found found on the Singapore streets. She mentioned specifically the Jews, the Arabs, the Parsis, the Bombay merchants, the Indians, the Malays, the Sikhs, the Chinamen, who wore different uh, costumes. So it must have been a very vibrant uh, scene where fashion was concerned. But however, when we looked at the early print advertisements, it does not reflect uh, this rich uh, mix of uh, fashion. And of course, that's because publications were targeted for a particular group, usually the educated, the wealthy, the well-connected Europeans and Asians. So most of the fashion was colonial fashion beginning in the 1830s. There were popular merchant houses like Little, Karsaji and Company. This was the forerunner of John Little and uh, Wampoa and Company. So the typical advertising style was listing all the merchandises. So here you can see uh, some of the merchandises advertised were English and French boots, Parisian bonnets, camisets, corsets, gloves, horse hair petticoats, muslin, silk and satin dresses, cashmere shawls and stockings. So it was very Western um, fashion trends that were uh, followed during that period. In 1869, the Swiss Canal was opened. This meant that uh, it cut down travel time between Europe and Singapore drastically. Uh, and this also enabled the demand for European fashion, which was also increasing, to be met promptly. Advertisements had become more pictorial by now. One British author, Horace Bleckley, who visited Singapore in 1925, recalled seeing well-dressed European women in frocks that followed closely the latest fashions of London and Paris. So here I've put an advertisement by Whiteaway and Laidwell Law. You can see like the women are typically dressed in different uh, Victorian era fashion uh, garments, uh, as well as uh, the carried children's wear. Another advertisement was of John Little, which carried different models of corsets. By 19th century, the hourglass figure had become the new ideal for feminine beauty um, and also social status. So uh, department stores were rushing to meet this demand. In men's fashion wear, you can see there's a Robinson's ad which of neckties. So neckties also had become a fashion statement for men who wanted to project power, wealth, elegance. And so had hats. Um, it had, by the turn of the century, um, it had reached its zenith. No Western man would step out of his house bareheaded. Isabella Bird also commented how the garments worn was very unsuitable for the weather. She was typically critical of the European women who she saw as ungraceful heaps of poofs and frills uh, in high heels and tight boots. Uh, and she said that they were unsuited to this climate or any climate actually. <laughs> so it revealed that the British still continued to dress as they would in Chile, England. Uh, and this was quite unsuited for the tropics. However, as we go on, we find that in the 1910s and 1930s, European fashion had started adapting to the tropical climate. There were cloth merchants in England, so there's an advertisement of John Pigott and uh, Makers Piccadilly. They were based in London, 
and uh, they cater clothes for Europeans living in the tropical climates or visiting the tropics. The pith helmet, which is a lightweight helmet, had become very popular uh, and European men wore it at all times to avoid sunstroke. Mosquito boot, vests made of absorbent materials, white and khaki drill suits became popular as well. The Makers Piccadilly ad, actually in the fine print, you can see that they said that they have an assistant in attendant who has experience dressing people who are going to the Malay states. So they actually had someone there who would cater to this demand. Um, local uh, department stores like Robinson's and Company also advertised cotton and linen fabrics for greater comfort in the local humidity. Though Singapore uh, department stores and merchant houses carried ready-to-wear garments right from the 1830s, it was seen that made-to-measure was the preferred choice. Tailor-made garments was always preferred. We found advertisements as early as 1830s which showed tailors arriving from Madras in Paris to offer their services for men and women. They advertised as master tailors, some even saying that they have experience in dressing for the tropical climate. There were many ads that we found for fabric stores. And um, they were typically located in the retail paradise of the colonial times, which is High Street, which is today's um, Hill Street to North Bridge Road. And then it extended all the way to Arab Street. And they carried imported textiles like silks and brocades and cottons and linens. And they also offered tailoring services. So tailoring was in demand. Department stores also jumped on the bandwagon. Robinsons and Company, uh, Aurora, John Little, they each had a tailoring department within their shopping um, stores. There were independent tailors who advertised. And by the 1950s, 1960s, you had local designers who were setting up shop. The second advertisement is from Jenny Chan, who was a local designer, who had set up her shop in Orchard Road. We didn't find so many ads for ready-made baju kurong, shampoos, uh, sarong kabayas, which is local garments. And we suspect one of the reasons could be the local women prefer to buy the material and go down to the tailor to get it stitched in their particular style. In 1961, the Women's Charter was passed. And the women had also st started entering the workforce. This had also given them disposable income. And many women had started wearing Western outfits, you know, to work and uh, for other purposes as well. If they could not afford the boutique designers, uh, from our readings what we found out is that they would head to High Street or to Geylang or to Sarangun, buy the material and go to their neighborhood dressmakers or the Shanganese tailors or the immaculately dressed Indian tailor to get it tailored. There was a change in the marketing strategies used by the advertisers. So in the 1830s, it was typically listings of merchandises, which moved on to uh, being more pictorial, along with uh, having the product prices highlighted. By the 20th century, there was product associations. So products started to become associated with particular lifestyles, desirable qualities, and celebrities, much like today, actually. Uh, here we can see John Little uh, has advertised smart clothes for the races. So uh, races was a typically recreational lifestyle for the Europeans or affluent Asians. Another example is of the Lux Toilet Soap, who um, got Hollywood actresses to endorse their products to get glorious skin. We also found advertisements of shoes, black print shoes and books, uh, boots, which were advertised as the choice of footwear for late King Edward VII. By the 1930s, uh, more locals were getting educated. There were more um, reach, uh, vernacular publications being published. There was a rising disposable income due to the rubber boom. Advertisers wanted to tap into this market. So they started advertising in local language newspapers. The first advertisement there is uh, of sarongs, which is advertised in Javi, and it's a Japanese company which was selling sarongs. The next is of pawns, uh, and they had a detailed write-up in Javi on how uh, to achieve uh, and beautify your skin, so the, the routines that a woman should follow. Figaro was a beauty parlor. It was owned by a European lady. This advertisement was uh, found in the Chinese uh, papers for hair perming services at 10 straight dollars. And the last one was Whiteaway Laid Law, which advertised in Javi for men's fashion.
Another strategy they used was engaging Asian models as face for the ad campaigns. Max Factor used a Malay model and advertised in Jawi. Uh, Yardley used a popular Malay actress. Bata, they advertised extensively and they advertised in all different languages, English, Malay, Tamil, Chinese. Their tagline was even shoes for everyone, so they went re very local on that. Lux used Lucila Yumin, who was a Hong Kong actress, to endorse their product. Regional brands also started advertising, and they advertised extensively in vernacular publications. Kuang Sang Hong Cosmetics was a Hong Kong brand who by the 1930s was best well established in uh, Singapore households. Gul Bahar was a scented hair oil, uh, which was advertised in Jawi. Anjula hair oil was advertised in Tamil. And the last one was Tata, which is an Indian company, and it advertised castor oil for the hair and coconut shampoo, and this advertisement was in Jawi. From the 1830s, advertisers um, focused on advertising Western products and tried to reach the Europeans. Soon they expanded to affluent Asians, and by the 1960s, Western products were still predominantly advertised, but they had also tried to create mass appeal to reach the locals. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. I will be sharing some, uh, on the advertis some of the observations that I got uh, when I was looking through the advertisements on entertainment. And that uh, basically I'm looking at uh, the major entertainment uh, venues, which namely the theatres, the cinemas, as well as the amusement parks. Like for example, for cinemas and movies, uh, some scholars, they will actually see those movie magazines published by the various film companies as part of their advertising for their uh, movies as well as the movie stars. So uh, for this uh, sharing, I will not be touching on those. It's mainly on uh, what most people would uh, will consider as advertisements. So like for example, you buy an ad space on magazines and uh, you have some artwork that, uh, that shows uh, to advertise your products. And that for source of uh, advertisements, uh, basically uh, I'm looking at materials in uh, the National Library's collection. So uh, one of the common source that you will know will be the newspapers and then as well as some of the magazines and we do have some of the movie flyers in our collections also. So first of all for theatre, as you can see, I already pointed out that it's a very versatile uh, venue, at least for myself, when I talk about, think about theatre, I will think about those performing arts. So for example, uh, plays, dance, and you can see this is uh, actually quite an early advertisement, which is in 1894 on local newspapers, and that it uh, is advertising for a uh, overseas uh, opera company which has come over to Singapore to perform. This is a much later one which is 1927. Just now the town hall actually is a predecessor of uh, Victoria Theatre. The main program for this one is actually a movie. They have a screening of a movie and that's the main actress. You can see over here, uh, this is her name, that he, uh, she came over to Singapore to promote the movie also and he, uh, she actually uh, did a performance after the screening of the movie. So you can see that uh, like even for a same program, a same session, you can have like two different types of uh, like the screening as well as the performing uh, at the same time. Although I mentioned that it's a multi-purpose venue, there are some of the theatres, uh, for example, this one they've shown here, which is the Theatre Royal uh, at Northbridge Road. It's particularly, in its early days, it's uh, actually associated with Bansawang. And this is an advertisement in 1906 on Bangsawan. So besides uh, this uh, theatre group, is also associated with another theatre group called Star Opera. But in the 1930s, it has a change of hands and it underwent some uh, renovations. After renovations, we can see that it actually opens up the theatre, have different types of performance. This one is the advertisement of an magical performance. You can see over here, there's also like Tamil Talkie, actually is uh, Tamil firms. 
So that's all for the theatres. I am moving on to the cinemas. Something that strikes me is that they have like advertising in different languages. So this one is advertisements from three different uh, newspapers, local newspapers. So we have here is the Malaya Tribune, Utusan Melayu, and as well as Lap Bao. And it's on the cinema, which is called the Halima Hall, and on the same uh, film that they are screening. And this is actually published on the newspapers on the same day, which is 1918, June 5th. I got a colleague to help me translate the Malay one because uh, I don't read it. <laughs> In terms of like how they try to advertise, it's rather similar as compared to the, the English and the Chinese ones. This is a movie flyer. For this one, the main one is English, but at the back of the flyer, you can see it is that it also tries to advertise in the different languages. So for the cinema, for one another selling point of theirs is that they try to sell their facilities, or rather is that they try to sell that their movies are like the newest, using the newest technology. And this advertisement was uh, published on newspaper in 1930s, and you can see that over here, I have uh, boxed it out, is that the film that they are uh, showing is actually all talking, singing and dancing. Because in the 1930s, before that, most of the films are actually silent films. And it was quite a novelty for uh, the films to actually to have voices, like sound recordings also. And besides that, you can see over here, they say this one actually features that the film is colored and using the technology of Technicolors. And as well as the other ones, sorry, it's rather small. This advertisement is a 1924 advertisement. It actually shows that it says scenes take in natural color. So we have more of the Technicolor uh, advertisements or advertisements that features Technicolor. Although it may not be the main point of the advertisement, but it's in a rather prominent position. Okay, besides the films itself using the, the latest technology, we also have the facilities. This is an uh, advertisement of Capitol just before it opens. And that it actually advertised that it's the finest equipped and most updated theatre in Malaya. And that it's the only theatre in the Orient fitted with fanless cooling system, ensuring a complete change of air every six minutes. Uh, but it's not air conditioner. <laughs> okay, and it has two leaves. Synchronized and talky films, sliding roof, and the seats is actually as supplies to Roxy Theatre, New York, and other of the world best theatres. Alhambra, the another theatre, when it went through renovation in the 1930s, after the renovation, it boasts itself as the first air conditioning theatre in Singapore. There's a coverage on the newspaper which says that it's actually mountain air climate. Something interesting that I found that some of his advertisements on his name, it actually shows this kind of like ice mountain like type setting. This is actually the last part of my presentation which is on the amusement park. I'm not sure does any of you have the memories of the amusement park. I'm sorry that for myself I didn't have personal experience. Most of the things about the amusement park is what I've read and as well as what I've seen from perhaps like movies and stuff. The amusement parks is basically like there are different types of entertainment. So it has uh, theaters and like stages and different types of stages. On one session, you can have like different types of performance like opera, Chinese opera. For the movies, it can show different types of movies at the same time also. So for the entertainment, these two uh, advertisements that are featured here is a 1947 advertisements of the Great War and the new world. So for the Great World, it boasts itself as having the modern facilities and then it has the performance of its time and the idealized entertainment. And whereas over here for the new world, it boasts itself as having comprehensive range of plays, movies, cabaret and performance. These two advertisements, it actually shows that first of all, they try to advertise themselves as you just come here, this is a one-stop entertainment for you. You come here and you can find whatever that you want. And as well as it has modern facilities for uh, people to enjoy. Over here is a 1959 advertisement of the happy world. We can see the same thing that is being retaliated again. Like it's exciting, colorful, colossal, and thumbs are popping all over the place. Also, it actually boasts itself as having air conditioner, Chinese restaurants, and like it has trailing new shows, rides, and growers. And you can see that it actually shows the different types of performances and offerings that they give. This is an earlier one, so it's a 1936 one, so you can see that it features the talkies. 
And then we have like cabaret nightly, tea and after dinner dances, and see the fun of the fair. We also have another advertisement which shows the programs, a new programs by the Great War in 1938. Some of the advertisements they have seen on the Wilson Park, they actually advertise on the different types of entertainment that they have in the park. But there are also specific advertisements that show specific programs like this one. It's a 1931 newspaper advertisement because that was the opening of the New World Arena. So they actually advertise only on the boxing match. Before I end my sharing, some of the concluding remarks that I will have is that for the entertainment, you can see that actually a lot of it is trying to advertise that okay, what they are offering is actually the new and then it's fun in town as you what you will expect from entertainment, of course. And besides looking at their marketing strategy, I think that the advertisement also gives some glimpses to the entertainment activities that you may find uh, in early Singapore, which we may not be enjoying now. Thank you. Hi, it's a fascinating talk. And I got a question for Ashata. So you mentioned that in the 1910s to 1930s, the fashion, European fashion started to transform a bit more into adopting the local tropical weather. So I'm just wondering, was that a quite smooth transformation into adopting the local um, weather was there any was was there any controversies like Europeans saying that it wasn't right to change their dress to not dress as British or as European as they used to be from what we found was basically they still dressed like how they would in Europe except the fabric changed so they started adopting cottons and linens, which were more suited for the weather. I was doing my research. I did find advertisement, uh, sorry, pictures of like uh, men lounging in sarongs, you know, the European men. But it's mostly uh, indoors. So I guess when they still went out to work or, you know, for official purposes or even entertainment, recreation, they would still uh, stick to the European wear. Maybe the, it's just the fabric for ready-made garments changed. I would like to pose this question to you, May. You actually covered in your presentation about uh, before the Japanese occupation and after that. Were there like um, influences to the adver advertisements uh, during the Japanese occupation? How did it change for cinemas and amusement parks and uh, the theatre? As far as we know, like for example, in Beauty World, there is uh, an amusement park. There are also some records of like some of the movies that come over from Japan. I'm sorry because I have not really looked at the advertisements during the Japanese occupation, so I can't really answer your question. Yeah, sorry about it. My name is Jeffrey. Um, I've just got a general question. Um, it's about um, the the way uh, the research was done, and um, I'm just wondering because you're going through newspapers and magazines and, and just a lot of different things, but you're looking at different topics at the same time. How did you actually divide up the work? If you were looking at a newspaper, there would be presumably things that would do with different categories, and would you have, you know, three people looking at the same newspaper at different times, or would it be one person? You know, how, how did it work? I'm just curious to know. It's not an exhaustive um, study because it would be practically impossible for like eight of us, nine of us to go through every single issue of newspaper ever published in the history of local um, yeah, publishing. So um, what we did was, um, I think we, for, for me at least, I, I combed through the papers to see what were the advertisements for hospitality that um, recurred pretty often and I took the ones that I found interesting and um, I did the same for books as well. For hospitality ads um, particularly, I think um, there were certain publications that you could approach where there would be more of such ads than others, such as um, directories, travel guides. There was a strategy because there was just so much public, so many publications, we could not have just gone through every single one of them. To just add, it was a really long process, so we started last March. <laughs> so. At, about the advertisements, about the hotel thing, uh, I just want to know, was there a discernible trend in the way the, the hotels pitch their advertisement? There's I, I'm intrigued because I think the last advert that was put up about a Seaview Hotel, there was some reference to Seaview Hotel being ridiculously priced. 
did they pitch themselves on a price war basis or services or convenience or or facilities or you know, how 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 did was there any discernible trend? This ad for the one that he's referring to was the free ozone one, which was um, in nineteen oh seven. This was before Sea View was bought over by the Sakis brothers, who also ran Adelphi and Raffles in the 30s up to like the 50s. Before the Sakis brothers actually bought over Seaview, I imagine was ridiculously priced, but probably after the Sakis brothers bought over the hotel, they really spruced it up and I don't think it would have been ridiculously priced anymore. And it became like a place, like quite quite luxurious accommodation for travellers who wanted to see the country in Singapore and experience the ozone. Did you guys come across anything on the regulation of the advertising industry? Because we see all this advertisement, but how was them being regulated? Like, was there anything on trade? trademarks, patent rights, copyrights, anything like that. Yeah, maybe just the trademarks. And I think the only kind of, well, not the only kind of regulation, but obviously um, the, the most patently obvious one would be for medical advertisements. So um, after the sale of medicine and a legislation that um, was enacted in the 1930s, I think they really clamped down on the types of medical advertisements you could publish. Yeah, because it was um, a lot of them, they were actually unscientific and unproven. But in terms of copyright or patentship, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Could you elaborate? It's like if one brand became quite popular, the trademark might be copied by others, the fake brands, like copycat. Was there any... I think things were a lot looser back then. So you could actually... Um, it could have been written by the same copywriter, in fact. So you, if you notice, a lot of the newspaper advertisements, they feature the same phrases. They recur over and over again, like irreproachable cuisine or a delightful time. Um, spent, you know, it's just like recurring phrases that one could infer that they might have been written by the same in-house copywriter paid for by the companies. Yeah, so um, other than that, I'm not entirely sure about like the piracy, but back then I think copyright laws were also a lot less strict. Uh, I'm not sure about the laws, but uh, we did come across advertisements by companies. So they would say that there's a fake product in the market, which is similar to us, you know, using our logo. So uh, please be careful, you know, of using. So we came across a few ads uh, which said that. But I'm not sure about uh, whether there was any advertisement regulation as such. I mean, thanks for the presentation. I thought it was great. But I was a little surprised by the fact that the ads you chose were overwhelmingly textual. Very few of them actually involved visuals, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, um, the hotels, the hotel ads, for instance, that Fiona talked about, there were visuals of architecture um, or certain lifestyle aspirations, uh, you know, palm trees, sun settings, and all that. Um, but the, the adverts that you chose were almost completely textual. In fact, some of them had rather interesting fonts. So a lot of what's happening, a lot of the creativity actually happened at the textual level as well. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas as to why that was? I think it might be more because uh, of the angle that I'm looking at as a uh, feature in the exhibition. Actually, another way of advertising, they feature the stars. So for that, actually, you will see more uh, like visuals. And it's more of because, yeah, as I said just now, I think it's more because of the the, the angle that I'm looking at. Those are really fascinating presentations. Um, I just have a question again uh, about perspective, because you mentioned that uh, in the 19th century, we do see a very Anglo perspective where hotels and fashion was like targeted towards uh, the, the uh, Westerners, uh, Europeans. I, I was just wondering whether that uh, after the uh, World War Two, that there is a swing to more uh, local advertisements, and I was just wondering whether in that period of time there's a reaction towards, uh, let's say, very European-centered kind of uh, advertisement. You know, um, whether World War Two was actually the thing that made the break then. 
Yes, there was some change. And we also saw, like, for the fashion that I did, there was also a certain amount of Malayization of fashion. So basically, uh, the sarong kabaya, the uh, baju kurong, um, they were also uh, gained prominence. And it was made, uh, they were given Western touches so that it was also catering to the locals, but also, you know, it was kind of fusion fashion that came about during that time. I'm not really sure whether it was specifically because of World War II or whether it was also, you know, a growing demand from the local population who had the income to purchase such things. All right, thank you. I'll take that as the last question for tonight. Uh, before you leave, please do come forward and uh, enjoy the display. Let's put our hands together once again for Fiona. Akshita and Yume. So thank you very much and have a very good, good evening.